Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this evening, Tuesday, 6th of February. It's wonderful here uh, presenting our first cardiology hot topics webinar through MB Medical. And we are delighted to be doing this in conjunction with the Primary Care Cardiovascular Society. My name's Nick Jones. I'm a GP in Oxford. I also work as a GP cardiologist. And as well as doing these educational roles, I'm interested in heart failure research, which is one of the reasons why I'm so delighted to be joining you today and talking about heart failure. Uh, I'm just coming to the end of a PhD looking at heart failure and atrial fibrillation, and I'm about to start on an academic clinical lectureship doing some more heart failure research. So this is all right up my street, and I'm very much looking forward to the hour ahead of us. I'm also looking forward to being joined by a wonderful team this evening. We're very lucky to be joined by the very esteemed Professor Ahmet Fuet. I'll hand over to Ahmet to introduce yourself. Ahmet, hello. Hello there, Nick. Yeah, it's a pleasure to join you and, and work with NB Medical. So I um, was a GP for 37 years in Darlington, uh, GPSI in cardiology for, for many years, an honorary professor of primary care cardiology on the back of doing a PhD on heart failure, um, diagnosis and management, natriuretic peptides. Um, and I also co-founded the new Primary Care Cardiovascular Society. So we're a community interest company. Our main aim is to upskill primary care um, in um, cardiovascular disease. And anyone can join. It's free to join. You then have access to our CVD Academy. And we have over 4,300 members um, GPs, nurses, clinical pharmacists, et cetera. So please feel free to join the site and delighted to, to be presenting this with Nick. So I'll listen in and I'll come back in and, and, and um, answer some questions later. Thanks, Nick. Thanks so much, Ahmed. And also on today, we've got Kate Digby who's joining us. Kate, hello, are you there? Good evening, Nick. Good evening, everyone. I am indeed here and I'm thrilled to be here this evening. I've just put a shout out on the chat box. I am being flooded with hellos from all across the UK. I can't see, I've seen, I haven't seen any. Oh, I've just seen a Netherlands GP popping up. So look, we have gone international this evening, which is very exciting. Uh, my name is Kate Digby. I am a GP partner in Siren Sester, which is in Gloucestershire, very pretty part of the UK. Um, and I've got a bit of a portfolio spread with other bits to my week, including PCN clinical director, training director for our, one of our local VTS schemes. And I've been working with MB now for the last mm, nearly 10 years, I think. So um, my role this evening is not to talk at you about all of the, the interesting cardiology bits that the two resident experts are going to discuss. I am here to field the questions. So please do keep me busy. Hopefully you've seen the chat box. I can see everybody's filling it up with hellos, which is great. Um, I am going to be busy beavering away behind the scenes, trying to get as many questions answered as possible. And I will be popping up throughout the hour to, um, to then pose some of your themed questions to our expert panels. So please do give me some good ideas on questions. Otherwise, I'm going to dip into my repository of things that I would like to know the answer to. I will be back with you at, at a in a short while once Nick has taken us through the first presentation. So I'll see you in a bit. Bye, Nick. Thank you, Kate. So the plan for the evening is we're going to start off by talking for the first sort of 20 or 25 minutes or so about some of the latest research from primary care about how we identify patients with suspected heart failure to inform that all important step on for diagnosis and confirmation of the heart failure, heart failure diagnosis in secondary care. Then we're going to have a break. There's going to be about 10 minutes or so where we're going to look at the questions that have been coming in through the first half of the session, put some of those to Ahmet as our in-house resident expert. And then we'll talk in the second half of the evening about categorization of heart failure and emerging therapies, particularly for people with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, because I think there's a lot going on in that field. And also it's an area where we're often left managing these patients fairly independently in primary care. So really good to make sure that we feel confident and skilled in that area. If you haven't been on an NB webinar before, 
Firstly, of course, welcome. But the nice thing about this is you've already, I'm sure, all had very long days. I suspect many of you have been at the coalface. Now's the time you can sit back, relax and enjoy and just try and soak up the information as we talk to you. We're going to present this as though we're talking through a patient that we're seeing in clinic. So we're going to try and make it as relevant as possible and also use that case-based discussion as a way of bringing out some of the sort of nuances around some of the um, evidence-based and guidelines and how they apply to us in practice. We will throw in a few MCQs. I always think those are good ways of testing our knowledge, also comparing about how we might treat patients against the uh, rest of the audience that we have online today. So once those come up, you can just click on the answer that you feel is most appropriate, and we'll look at the um, results we get in as a, as a group together. And as I mentioned, there's going to be some breaks for Q&A as we go through. It may well be that you forget to ask a question today and that something comes up at a later date or there's something that you're particularly interested in that you feel deserves more time than a quick question in a chat bot this evening. If you'd like to ask anything later on, do feel free to email Kate or I. There are email addresses there. Very easy to remember. Our first name's at mdmedical.com. Also, I hope you can stay for the whole hour, but if you do have to duck off before the end for some reason, then um, this will be filmed tonight, the webinar, and you'll be able to watch it again at your leisure online. If you miss some juicy morsel and you want to go back and remind yourself what we said at three minutes into the presentation, feel free to do that. And do uh, let other colleagues know if you felt it was a useful presentation, they can log in and watch too through the website. Really handy as well that this can be um, totted up towards your appraisal. So if you're using the MB dashboard, that will sync together with um, the MB with the appraisal toolkits you're using. So a really nice way of keeping a log of the learning you're doing. And just one quick plug, we are at the moment developing a new primary care cardiology course through NB Medical. The first launch date is going to be on Saturday, the 27th of April. So if you're an MB subscriber and you'd like to do a bit more of a deep dive into a wider range of cardiology topics, do please join us on that morning. We're going to be talking about things like um, AF and ischemic heart disease, some of the sort of big hitters of cardiovascular disease, but also thinking a bit about, you know, more how do these people present to us in primary care? What do you do with a patient presenting with palpitation, say, or a young person with syncope? How might we manage that situation and who needs onward referral? Um, and I think that'll be really, really useful um, a session to try and think about, about you know, our role in the management of these people in primary care. I put up this lovely old woodcut here, which is from the Welcome Collection. This is an ancient Chinese medicine version of cardiovascular anatomy. And I just thought it's really interesting to see the sort of where things have come from and where we're going uh, thinking about cardiovascular disease, which is what this evening is all about, thinking about the latest research and putting that into place. And just one reassuring thing we always say on these courses is we're not paid by anyone to be here other than the funding that comes through delegates joining the courses. So we're not funded by any pharmaceutical or anything to give you any of this information. This is GPs like Kate Armit and ourselves looking through latest resources and trying to present to you what we think is important. So that's our spiel. Let's jump in with an initial case just to get things rolling and to try and get the gray cells working. Meet Alison. Imagine you are in clinic tomorrow morning and Alison comes to see you. She's a 74 year old lady. And the main thing that you've been seeing Alison about is how very difficult to manage hypertension. This has been rumbling on over the past two or three years. She's on maximum doses of ramipril, amlodipine. She's now on indapamide as well. She also has type 2 diabetes. She takes metformin and glyclozide for that. She's an ex-smoker, but stopped many years ago. BMI, which you check again today, is 36, which puts her into the obese class, of course. But the reason that Alison has come to talk to you today is because of symptoms. And the thing that's bothering Alison is that she's noticed that she's getting progressively more short of breath. She lives about 200 meters from the local Aldi shop. And she says now getting down there is really a struggle. She's having to pause and stop for breath on the way. And she's been coughing ever since Christmas as well. It's a fairly non-productive dry cough, but it's bothering her. And she's feeling really tired and washed out. She's in fact wondering whether it could be a respiratory tract infection, whether she might need an antibiotic for this. You dig down a little bit thinking about differential diagnoses, thinking about heart failure, but she doesn't have orthopnea or PND or ankle swelling. So I know that's a fairly limited amount of information. There's lots more that you might want to ask Alison in this situation, but just thinking about what's your approach to the sort of first assessment and first investigations that you might do in a patient presenting with undifferentiated breathlessness. Do you think an ECG would be helpful? Would that be one of your first tests that you might do in this scenario? Click on A if so. 
What about spirometry? Of course, Alison is an ex-smoker. Do we need to think about COPD as the number one differential diagnosis? Chronic cough going on for a number of weeks, ex-smoker, you might be thinking lung cancer, should we do a chest x-ray? Or there's an option of checking some blood tests. What about non-specific symptoms like fatigue being a presentation of anemia, for example, or checking her electrolytes given that she's on some medication like a, uh, a thiazide like diuretic might impact on her kidney function. And of course, the NT-Pro BMP test that you might be thinking if you were thinking of a presentation of heart failure based on Allison's symptoms. You might feel like you just want to do all of the above. And of course, that might be the right thing to do, although you're unlikely to get all of those tests back at the same time. And you may feel like if you were seeing Allison in practice, that it's worth thinking about prioritizing one or two of these tests in the first instance and using those to go on to inform future management options. So there's no right or wrong answer here, but I think it's useful to think about our approach to dealing with breathlessness and about the types of tests that we particularly find helpful in this scenario. There's always a bit of a lag with this uh, online platform that we use. So I can see that you guys are uh, answering the questions as it come in, but it takes a minute or two before that happens, before the uh, results get totted up on the screen. So I'll just give you an extra 10 or 15 seconds to have a think, put down your answer, and then we'll share the slide and we can see what everyone's putting. Okay, I hope that's long enough. Sorry if you haven't had time to answer, but don't worry, as long as you sort of thought in your head, I think we've had enough delegates answer that we can get a pretty good snapshot here. And interesting to see the answer. So yeah, I think really helpful. I think a chest x-ray is probably a really good thing to think about here and certainly would be a guideline recommendation of someone with a chronic cough going on for six weeks or more. Many of you thinking about starting with blood tests, I suspect perhaps the NT-Pro BMP standing out given the nature of the talk here, slightly leading. Um, and lots of you saying, well, lots of those tests might be useful to do in a patient with breathlessness. Alison has had her ECG and blood done. And those are probably the things you're going to get back first. And here are some data for you to start looking at. So her full blood count looks reasonably normal. She's got a raised creatinine looking back. That's actually been fairly steady for some time, although she hasn't been coded yet with chronic kidney disease. It certainly falls into that category. Her NT-Pro BMP is quite significantly raised over 1,000. She's got a normal CRP and TSH. HbA1c of 56, probably not too bad in someone her age, given that she's got an established diagnosis of diabetes. And then an ECG, which I thought we'd just look at, because I know often the feedback we get is that people feel quite sort of uncomfortable or unconfident, perhaps I should say, at looking at ECG. So you can see on the ECG here, it's not giving you the automated readings, but you can see that there's a fairly long PR interval. So she's got first degree heart block. If you look at lead three, you can see it's mostly negative there. So she's got some left axis deviation. If you look at the QRS complexes in the lateral leads, particularly in V3, you might argue they're slightly enlarged. So she might be heading towards some left ventricular hypertrophy. Also, you might look at leads AVL and uh, lead one, lead um, AVR, possibly even lead V6, and think there's possibly a hint of T wave inversion or ST depression, possibly some old ischemic changes on the ECG here. Certainly not a normal ECG. So what do we do? We've got this lady who's 74. She's presented us with the core symptom of breathlessness and fatigue developing over a period of a few weeks. What do NICE tell us if we're thinking about heart failure diagnosis here? Well, of course, as with everything in medicine, it starts with taking the detailed history examination, performing your clinical examination, but then going on and doing as many of you wanted to do, measuring the NT-Pro BMP level and using that as both a uh, test to inform who's going to be assessed for heart failure, but also to triage the urgency of that referral with patients who have an NT-Pro BMP level over 2,000 being prioritized for an urgent, almost a two-week wait cancer type referral for assessment in a secondary care clinic. Armit, Kate and I were talking before we came on about sort of lead times for echocardiograms and things. And I'd be really interested to know if there's anywhere in the country at the moment that is managing to meet that target of specialist assessment or an echo within two weeks of an urgent referral for an elevated NT-Pro BMP level over 2000 with suspected heart failure. So really interesting. So that's the sort of nuts and braces. And I suspect that many of you will be familiar with this sort of diagnostic assessment pathway. 
But what we're going to talk a little bit about in the coming slides is about some of the challenges around heart failure diagnosis and about the central role of NT Pro BMP. How can it be our friend in primary care, but also what are some of the pitfalls that we need to be aware of in terms of interpretation of that, given its very central place there in, um, in informing which patients are going to get assessment in secondary care for heart failure. So we've mentioned about when we're going to suspect heart failure. It's very clear at the top line of that nice guideline that we're looking at these core symptoms of breathlessness, fatigue and peripheral edema. We're also going to think, though, aren't we, about possible additional symptoms. And the things we're really thinking about here are symptoms like orthopnea, PND. Those are going to be symptoms of fluid overload or dizziness and syncope, uh, symptoms that might suggest there's a low cardiac output as well. I think something that's really helpful when we're sort of risk stratifying patients with heart failure is, of course, thinking about almost the pre-test probability before we see that patient about heart failure. What's their risk of having heart failure based on their comorbidities? Is this a patient with known ischemic heart disease, chronic kidney disease, atrial fibrillation, a patient with obesity or hypertension? All these things are risk factors for, atri for um, heart failure. So really, really important that we think about those comorbidities because that will help us pick up on patients who are at a high risk of heart failure. Also important to ask about substance misuse and alcohol, particularly in younger people, that can be an early sign of presenting um, heart failure, sort of alcoholic cardiomyopathy, for example, in people who drink heavily from a young age. So something that's really easy to miss, I think, unless we go seeking that information, people may be reluctant to tell us or may normalize the amount of alcohol they're drinking. So really, really important if we're thinking about heart failure to ask about it. And again, really important point here is thinking about family history, perhaps less important in a patient who's presenting with heart failure at the typical age of diagnosis, sort of mid seventies or so. But if you've got a patient presenting with heart failure symptoms in the forties, fifties or sixties, then thinking about their family history and their risk of this being an inherited cardiac condition is really, really important too. And then we're going to examine patients for heart failure. So we're going to look for signs of fluid overload. I'm sure many of you will do this already. If we're doing the sort of bolt and braces approach, we're going to look for signs like JVP and ascites, as well as the things that I'm sure most of us are doing, which is having a look at the legs and listening to the chest for look for fluid overload. But we might want to do extra tests, which I think are really important. So listening for abnormal heart sounds. You can, of course, have um, systolic dysfunction in patients who have uh, valvular heart disease, for example. You may be able to pick up a displaced apex beat if you feel on the patient's precordium to feel that. So some of these things can really start helping to build a picture about this likelihood of heart failure or not in patients who are presenting with breathlessness and fatigue and some of those less clear symptoms. And then we've spoken about the importance of checking an ECG and looking for patients underlying rhythm, particularly important because we know it's so common in patients with atrial fibrillation for them to develop heart failure. Probably somewhere between a quarter and a third of patients with atrial fibrillation will develop heart failure at some point in their life. So really important to look for that. More about the challenges, that makes it sound easy, doesn't it? I'm sure if there's patients who present with lots of peripheral edema and very breathless and they've got crackles in their chest and, you know, displaced apex beat and things, we're all going to be thinking about heart failure. But there's been a very interesting editorial published in the British Journal of, Gen um, of General Practice just last year talking about some of the challenges. And one of the issues is that often these symptoms like breathlessness or a cough or fatigue are nonspecific and either the patient or us as clinicians may attribute those symptoms to the normal aging process or because patients with heart failure so commonly have other comorbidities like COPD or AF that might make them feel breathless, it's very easy for this sort of diagnostic overshadowing to lead to us thinking about that comorbidity being the cause of the symptom. Another challenge we have is about the use of BMP testing. Again, it'd be really interesting to know, is this something that you have easy access to in primary care where you are? But believe it or not, there does still seem to be a few places in the UK where that isn't the case. And I imagine that must, must, must make your life very, very challenging given the central role of BNT, BMP in normal referral. So I think there are some challenges here. And we know that some of the factors that are associated with a sort of fast track referral for heart failure assessment and that guideline recommended route are some of the things that we might expect. So patients who are living in a lower area of social deprivation, who don't have chronic respiratory disease, who present with typical symptoms like breathlessness, for example, and who get followed up in primary care by their GP after the presenting symptom. All of those things seem to be more likely to lead to an earlier and guideline recommended route of diagnosis. And of course, you can invert those things and think about some of the challenges in the patients who are not getting that early diagnosis and recognize some of the people who may be at risk. 
And this is really important because there's some longstanding data showing that as many as two thirds of patients with heart failure are currently being diagnosed in hospital during the time of an acute admission. I think that is changing re- over time, but I've seen some more recent data still suggesting that about 50% of people with a heart failure diagnosis are diagnosed in hospital. Now, we're never going to be able to diagnose everybody with heart failure in primary care. Of course, some of those patients may have acute heart failure secondary to acute atrial fibrillation or another, um, you know, sort of rapidly onset uh, um, condition. So we're never going to be able to get that down to to zero. But when you uh, look at some of the qualitative data of patients who are being diagnosed with heart failure in secondary care, it's clear that some of those patients, there was a window of opportunity where they saw their primary care clinician with breathlessness or fatigue, probably symptoms of heart failure. And that was perhaps under investigation or had been taken down a different diagnostic route and heart failure not diagnosed before they went into hospital. So what about NT-Pro BMP? We've thought about the type of patients where we might want to use it. How accurate is this as a test and how much can we rely on it? Well, this was a recent paper published in the BJGP using a large primary care cohort. And they looked at the diagnostic accuracy in this study of both BMP and NT-Pro BMP. And they did this looking at two different thresholds. One is the threshold set by NICE for a positive result of 400. And the other is the threshold set in the European guidelines of 125. And what they found, perhaps unsurprisingly, is that if you use the lower threshold, of course, you miss less cases of heart failure, but you get many more false positive results. So at the threshold of 400, which we're being encouraged to use by NICE, the the negative predictive value at the population level is 98%. So that's a very sort of encouraging result, probably because overall, there's many other patients who are having NT-Pro BMP testing who've got other reasons for being breathless. So it's a good rule out test in a sense, but also we need to be aware that the sensitivity of the test at that threshold is about 80%, i.e. around one in five patients who have a negative result will later go on to be diagnosed with heart failure. Also, if you flip it the other way and you look at the positive predictive value of an NT-Pro BMP level above that 400 threshold, almost one in three of those patients go on to be diagnosed with heart failure. If you compare that to tests that we're using to sort of triage cancer referrals, where the cutoff is usually around 3%, I think there's quite a big difference there in terms of this test. And we're probably using it or perhaps underusing it in patients at the moment. So something perhaps to think about and something I'd be interested to hear um, more about from Armit in the Q&A and what we think here. But of course, there are challenges. And if we were to lower this threshold down to 125, although we'd be missing less cases of heart failure, perhaps at that early stage in primary care, we'd get many more false positive results, many more patients we'd be referring on for echocardiogram, and many places in the country where that resource is already under stress. So really difficult challenge here. The conclusions from this paper is that the current threshold may be just about right in the NHS, but it leaves an impetus on us to make sure that we think about inpatients where the NT-Pro BMP result might be near to that threshold of 400, that we're certainly still thinking about heart failure and that we shouldn't be ruling it out on the basis of a single test alone. So here's a question for you to get you thinking again, which of the following factors might suppress an NT-Pro BMP result? So i.e. if you had a patient with 380 NT-Pro BMP, but they have one of these other comorbidities, would any of these be making you feel perhaps a little bit uneasy? Would you be thinking, well, perhaps this is a patient who might have heart failure? So we've got atrial fibrillation, an acute kidney injury, obesity, sepsis, diuretic medication, Um, ACE inhibitors, COPD, or pulmonary embolism. I'll just click back on there. Hopefully that will give you a minute to answer, um, should come through. So on this one, if you want to click on more than one answer, again, you should be able to do that if you feel that there's more than one of these answers which might contribute to a suppressed NT Pro and B, uh, Pro BMP result. I hope it's gone back. I think it just flicked forward. So I'm not sure if I clicked a slide forward, but I hope you can all see the... um, the poll at the moment to click on that. So it should come through. Again, we'll just give you a couple of minutes. Sorry, there is a bit of a delay here. So it gives you guys time to think, but um, gives me a chance to get a breath of water as well. So we'll just take two more minutes to see that poll come through. And then we can look at some of the factors that you guys think might be relevant here. Okay, 
hopefully that's enough for many of you to have a chance at voting. Sorry if it's not quite everyone, but let's have a look at what we've got. So this is factors, remember, that would give you a sort of falsely low level of anti-pro BMP here. And the things that I would pick out are certainly diuretic medication, which is one of the big ones that you guys have identified. Also, ACE inhibitors or an ARB there, and around a third of you saying obesity as well. And those are really the big three. In fact, some of the other things that are on here are other causes of a raised anti-pro BMP results. And we can see this here on this sort of simplified diagram showing things that, um, showing factors associated with a decreased level of anti-pro BMP or an increased level. So factors that might decrease the level of anti-pro BMP are certainly increasing body weight. And that's really interesting when we're thinking about the HEF-PEF population, where many of those patients, some, some studies report even up to 80% of people with, with HEF-PEF will be overweight or obese. So really important about the sort of impact that might have on the accuracy of anti-pro BMP results, but also other commonly used treatment. There'll be many of these patients with hypertension who are on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. So interesting to think about what that does for your anti-pro BMP level. Similarly, anti-pro BMP can increase over time. So there was a study published using Scottish data uh, in the last year or two that looked at a large population, about 18,000 people in the community without established cardiovascular disease, looking at their anti-pro BMP levels. And they found that among people with um, age 80 years or above, the median level of anti-pro BMP was about 280 in men and 250 in women. So you can see that over time, there's a steep increase in anti-pro BMP levels just because of age. But many other things can raise it as well. So tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, sepsis, renal impairment, all of these things, smoking also can increase your anti-pro BMP level. So it's not a perfect test. And I think this is really, really important data for us to think about when we're deciding which patients need onward investigation and referral in secondary care. Also important to know that typically the anti-pro BMP level is lower at the time of diagnosis among people with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. So that cohort that we're going to focus on in the treatment summary of patients who are likely to have a lower level of anti-pro BMP at diagnosis and also a people, a cohort who might have uh, suppressed levels because of increased body weight and perhaps some of the other medication they're on. It is important thinking about the level at diagnosis as well as um, identifying people with possible heart failure, but also because the reason why NICE are recommending this urgent onward assessment for people with a very high anti-pro BMP level is because it has a prognostic significance. So you can see here from the Kaplan-Meier that the uh, cohort in blue, these are people who have an anti-pro BMP at the time of diagnosis above 2,000 compared to those who have a milder elevation in anti-pro BMP of 400 up to 2,000, there's about a 50% higher chance of a heart failure related death across about a year follow up and double the odds of a hospital admission in that year for that patients with the highest level of anti-pro BMP. So really important that we're thinking about those higher levels of anti-pro BMP as a sort of a warning sign to make sure that we're referring those patients on for rapid assessment and diagnosis if possible. And again, some other primary care data over time. And this is really interesting, I think, showing that over time on the left graph here, natriuretic peptide testing rates over time, you can see that we are using MP testing more in primary care. But if you look at the graphs on the right, what this is trying to show, and you can see, I hope that they're very static, is that in fact, the median level of NP, anti-pro BMP at the time of diagnosis is very static over the past 15 years or so. Most patients getting diagnosed with an NP level typically just over a thousand. And I Again, I think this goes back to the point of saying that there might be an opportunity for us to think about more anti-pro BMP testing in primary care to try and pick up on patients at an earlier stage of diagnosis. And why does that matter? Well, of course it matters because getting that primary care referral in is the gateway to starting the diagnosis and, of course, the gateway to starting effective treatment for patients with heart failure. We know that the mean five-year survival for people with heart failure is only just over 50%, so similar to many types of cancer. And in fact, over the past 20 years, survival's improved only very modestly for people with heart failure. And yet now there are quite a number of evidence-based treatments that can improve prognosis for this cohort of people. So trying to get those foundation steps right of assessment and onward referral and using the NT-Pro BMP level to triage that referral is really critical to getting these people started on treatment. So a few conclusions before we jump over to the Q&A. So we've spoken about the difficulty in diagnosing heart failure. Symptoms might be nonspecific, 
It's often an older cohort of patients with multiple comorbidities. And we've got to think about risk stratifying them based on those comorbidities, based on the symptoms they're coming to see us with, and based on that all important clinical history and examination. NT Pro BMP is a really, really useful test. It's central to the diagnostic pathway, but we need to be aware of those caveats around other patient factors that might impact on the result and not discount a diagnosis of heart failure just because the, th the diagnosis of uh, the, um, the test result that we get back for NT Pro BMP level is below 400. That initial test can be important both in providing prognostic information and impacting on the urgency of onward referral. So that's where we're going to pause for breath. I'm going to hand over to Kate in the Q&A box to sum up some of the questions that are coming in and then hopefully to hear from Ahmed about what he thinks about diagnosis and to answer some of those key questions. Over to you first, Kate. Well, thank you very much indeed, Nick. What a great start to this and so many questions pouring in about um, the challenges that we have when it comes to diagnosing heart failure. So before I start to apply our resident experts with some questions, just some common themes that I've had, um, I've had coming back sort of just to reflect the, the sort of mood of the nation. And indeed it is the nation because not only have we got all four devolved nations of the UK involved in this webinar, but we've also got international representation from Europe. So this is, this is you know, it's, it's, this is hot off the press, people. Watch out. Um, lots of people reflecting on the challenge that we have with comorbidities and polypharmacy and how so many things can impact or affect a BNP result that how do we pick out those with heart failure and those without? It's really tricky, isn't it? We have had a few people say that they can't actually request a BNP still um, from their surgeries. They can, it can only be requested once patients have been clinically referred, query heart failure. And we, of course, have had reflections that getting an echo in the timely fashion is often quite tricky as well. So those are sort of just some of the common themes coming back, but it just really highlights how difficult our job is in primary care and why you know this webinars like this are just so helpful. Now, um, to take it back down a level, please, if I can, Nick and Ahmed, because one of the questions that has come up multiple times so far this evening is what is the difference between BNP versus NT Pro BNP? And I guess the second bit to that question is, A, what's the difference? And B, can BNP be used to monitor disease control? I don't know which of you experts would like to yeah. take that one. Yeah, I'm happy to take that. Um, so basically, we've got a peptide that sits in cardiac muscle, mainly in the left ventricle, um, called ProBNP. And when the heart goes, uh, comes under strain uh, because of afterload or preload, then the, the ProBNP is split into the active moiety, which is BNP, and the inactive moiety, which is NT pro BMP. And that has a physiological purpose. So raised BMP increases diuresis, naturesis, leads to vasodilation and tries to compensate. Both can be measured in blood, but the reason that NICE says use NT pro BMP is because NT pro BMP is stabler in blood for longer than BMP. So if you sent a sample from, you know, I've seen people from Northumberland and Durham on here, you know, if you send a sample from Berwick down to Newcastle, take six hours throughout the day, BMP may degrade, NT pro BMP doesn't as much. So that's why, although it probably makes very little difference if you're in a, a town where the sample is getting there or if you're using point of care. There is no evidence for using NT pro BMP to monitor heart failure. And the reason is that there's significant diurnal variation and various studies that have tried to look at that largely have not shown any benefit of using the test to monitor because we should be able to monitor patients through symptoms, signs, how they feel, um, uh, and so basically clinically. I hope that answers both of those, Kate. 
Thank you, Ahmed. That does indeed. That's very helpful. And I guess, um, so just following on from that, another question which has come up quite a few times this evening is um, a question regarding using, perhaps, well, I guess either being more proactive with requesting um, NT Pro BNPs on a wider, a wider variety of patients. And I guess if you take that sort of back one level again, if you strip it off one level again, is, is, there any, is there any suggestion that perhaps in the future we will have a screening tool for heart failure, almost like we have for sort of pre-diabetes that will be trying to identify people on a mo more proactive basis before yeah, that it gets symptomatic? Sure. Absolutely. So, so I'm sure everyone is aware for screening, you have to meet very high um, cost effectiveness um, sort of criteria. Um, and there is no good evidence for wide scale screening in pa uh, of patients with BMP. There is some work around screening patients who are diabet have been diabetic for five years or more, because many of them will develop heart failure, often HFPF. So what I tended to do when I was a clinician and my practice is, I, I, I think I said I retired last year, but at retirement, my practice's prevalence for heart failure was 3.2%. So because since 2010, everyone who came to our long-term conditions clinics with conditions that increase the risk of heart failure. So anyone with coronary artery disease, if someone's had an MI, then two thirds of them go on to develop F, REF at some point, AF, previous stroke, obesity, diabetes, CKD. We asked very specific questions about symptoms. So if they had edema, breathlessness, orthopnea, PND, we had a very low threshold for checking NT pro BMP. So more targeted detection rather than screening. Um, because your epidemiologists, if you start talking about screening, will jump down your throat straight away without the, the evidence. So I think that's what I would say. You know, think about heart failure. Ardens have have um, questionnaires um, for long-term conditions asking about breathlessness based actually on some of the work we did in Darlington starting, I think, in 2007. Super. Thank you. And I think I've probably got time for one more question. And this is really just a reflection on the fact that the, the general frustration with the, the timely access to echoes that people have felt. One mm -hmm. question was, how long do you think it will be before we have some simple echo machine that we can use in primary care, rather like we now use bladder scans to look at to look at patients' bladder volume? What do you do you think that that is coming down the road? Will can we look forward to some some uh, new funky gadget to help us in primary care? I saw that question and had a little chuckle. I wish it was as easy, but I mean, I did echocardiography um, training. I stopped doing it very early into my career because electrophysio, I didn't do as many, um, enough to remain updated. And I wish it was as simple as that, but it's not. I mean, echocardiography of the heart is incredibly complex. And I think to be able to conduct it in primary care, you would have to have very significant training. However, um, we are getting into this age of AI, aren't we? And there was a study done up, up in Scotland by Mark Preetry, as a professor of heart failure up at the Royal Jubilee in Glasgow, a close friend and colleague. And the OPERA study looked at a handheld AI-guided um, echo, which was done by non-trained specialists, well, non-specialists, and they had a little bit of training on how to do it, where to position it, whatever. And that machine then generated a report. And in the vast majority of cases, it was good enough to make a diagnosis of, of heart failure. But if it did show anything else, such as valvular disease, et cetera, you have to go on and do a full 
scale echocardiogram. So it could be that in the future, we may have handheld echo devices with AI to do that. And Kate, may I, may I just come in, I think, very quickly to, to, to talk about the, the 125400. I believe very strongly that we should have age-related cutoffs. And I'm actually very disappointed that NICE didn't even consider that. Um, I do have a bit of a conflict here because I was one of the authors of the, the main paper that looked at age-related cutoffs. We looked at lots of variables and we found that, yes, things like diuretics, ACE, beta blockers, obesity, and um, uh, re reduced BMP or anti-pro-BMP levels, and that being female slightly increased it. But none of those made a significant difference. And the only significant difference was age. And I believe if we had age-related cutoffs, and what we used in Darlington for many years was 50 cutoff if you were under 50, sorry, under 60, 60 to 75, 125, and over 75, 450. And we never published that study. I wish we did, but there were lots of issues at the time, including me going off with a cancer diagnosis, our um, registrar taking ill as well. We never published it. But many areas do use age-related cutoffs, and I think that would actually help access. So I think we need to push that. Thank you so much. I think we could keep plying you for question, with questions all evening, but I think in the interests of time, let's hand back to Nick for the next section, sure. and then I'll come back to you at the end. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks very much. Thanks, Kate. Back to you, Thanks, then, Kate. Nick. I, thank you. Thank you, Kate. And yeah, I think that's a really interesting point about age-related cutoffs, because I saw there's a couple of other sort of questions related around that, around what about interpreting um, enteropro BMP in people with atrial fibrillation, for example? Yeah. Um, what about, you know, sort of suppressed levels in people on medication? At the moment, we just have these hard and fast thresholds, don't we? And it's a very blunt instrument. I think that's what we're trying to sort of get to with the um, presentation at the first part there, that it is very difficult. If you've got someone who has AF and an enteropro BMP level of 500, that may well be largely driven by the atrial fibrillation. But we don't really know. I think in that context, if you've got someone who you're suspecting has heart failure for another reason, and they've got an elevated anti-pro BMP test, and they've never had an echocardiogram, it's reasonable to think about referring them for that. But, but you know, we don't have a threshold to say. Similarly, there are some people reporting challenges if you've got an anti-pro BMP below 400, that people won't you know, accept an onward referral. I think in that scenario, really, you just have to try and be as clear as you can about why you still think it might be heart failure. So if you say that, you know, it's a patient who's got a BMI of 35, they're on a high dose of an ACE inhibitor, the anti-pro BMP is 370, and they're breathless with exertion peripheral edema, I think people will be much more willing to accept that referral than probably if we just say, you know, I think it's heart failure and we don't give a lot of details. So I know we're all very busy and that takes more time to give that detail, but probably a little bit of extra information if we're trying to get those uh, you know, cases through when the NT Pro BMP is just below the threshold probably does pay dividends in the long run. I wish we had two hours to talk about this because there's so many more questions, but we'll go on to uh, the treatment of, of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and then we'll have a bit more time for questions at the end. So let's go back to Alison. So Alison was started on a loop diuretic and referred on to the heart failure clinic because of that raised anti-pro BMP level. And she was seen about three or four months later and had an echocardiogram done. And this showed evidence of um, increased left ventricular filling pressures. So these are some of the changes that you might expect to see in a patient who is diagnosed with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. So you, you can see these enlargement of the left atrium. You can see increases in the left ventricular filling pressures. Um, you might see other markers of diastolic dysfunction. But of course, critically, that left ventricular ejection fraction will be within the normal range. And so she comes back to you with this diagnosis made of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And we just thought we'd take a minute to make sure that everyone's sort of comfortable with this categorization, because it is really central to the way that all the international guidelines at the moment are recommending we assess patients with heart failure 
and informs their treatment. So we've got these three different groups here. We've got patients who have an ejection fraction below 40%. We've got patients who have an ejection fraction above 50%. That's the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And then in the middle, we've got this sort of mid-range group. Some people call them mildly reduced ejection fraction or mid-range ejection fraction. So I think we're going to focus in a bit on the second half of this talk on this group with HEFPEF. So they've been diagnosed with heart failure, but the left ventricle, the ejection fraction is still above 50%. One thing that I think is really important, it's a kind of an obvious thing to say, but of course, it's not the ejection fraction being over 50% that's really defining the heart failure diagnosis. It's those other other mentors of diastolic dysfunction and left ventricular filling pressures. Those, those things are the important concepts that are defining the diagnosis. So it's almost a sort of a diagnosis of exclusion to contrast it with that group who have the HEFREF category. And I say that because I think what we'll find over time is that probably people with HEFREF are actually quite a sort of heterogeneous group. There'll be different types of patients presenting with HEFPEF. So we might see some elderly patients, elder patients who have had long-standing hypertension, for example, that might be one distinct uh, group. There might be another group who are much more of a sort of metabolic syndrome type group of patients. Obesity may be a sort of key component of their condies there, or other groups of patients who have atrial fibrillation where rhythm control or rate control is a real sort of core aspect of that heart failure phenotype. So I think although we've got this sort of core categorization that's really important in terms of the different medication we're going to offer our patients, actually, once we dig down into the HEFPEF group, there's going to be a number of different types of patients within that. Also really important thinking about that is about coding, because I think it's really central to thinking about the follow-up and management of these patients that we've got that clear diagnosis on the system. And again, if there's time, I know that one of the problems that sometimes comes back to us in primary care is unclear codes from a hospital admission, you know, an echocardiogram saying there's left ventricular systolic dysfunction or other markers, but not a clear diagnosis of heart failure. So if we've got time at the end, that might be an interesting thing to come back to. But I think let's keep in our heads this clear distinction based on the left ventricular ejection fraction. And let's think about that with Alison. So she's been diagnosed with HEFPEF. Remember, she's someone who's got relatively well type, controlled type 2 diabetes. She's also got chronic kidney disease and hypertension. In this scenario, imagine that you perhaps had either got the echocardiogram report back without her seeing a cardiologist yet, or you're suspecting heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. What would be your sort of initial thinking in terms of management here? So again, you've got a few different options. They're not mutually exclusive, but click on A if you'd like to go for a sort of symptom-based treatment initially with a loop diuretic such as fruzamide. What about jumping to spironolactone as um, an MRA, a different type of diuretic to treat her perhaps symptomatically? What about a beta blocker? Would you use that even in the absence of, of um, atrial fibrillation in someone with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction? An SGLT2 inhibitor, one of these newer medications called Arnie's, that's uh, Entresto being the common brand name for those, or an ACE inhibitor are very commonly used medication. It seems to be one of those sort of go-to drugs for many cardiovascular conditions. Is that something that we should be looking to get our patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction on? So a range of different medication options that we can go for there have a think which one might be your starting treatment. Also, obviously, while these questions are up, just reflecting a little bit in your own mind about what types of you know, individual patient characteristics might push you towards one of these treatments or not, what patient characteristics might indeed put you off using one of these drugs or be cautious about trying to think about using one of those drugs. Okay, so I hope that's given you a minute to answer. Let's click through and see. So interestingly, about a third of you going for the option of a loop diuretic, I think that was actually what Alison had had already in the case scenario, a very reasonable option in terms of trying to get on top of symptom control first. About a third of you saying an SGLT2 inhibitor, we're going to touch on that soon. That's a very hot topic and something that we wanted to cover. And about a quarter of you thinking an ACE inhibitor as perhaps one of the sort of commonly beneficial drugs for the heart in general here. Just to make sure we're all on the same page with this concept of HEFPEF. So what is HEFPEF? We've got this sort of categorization of heart failure, but what is HEFPEF? So to have a diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, of course, first of all, obvious to say perhaps, but you need to have signs or symptoms of heart failure. Then you need to have these evidence on an echocardiogram or other tests of evidence of increased left ventricular filling pressures, ideally with the raised MP test, be it BMP or anti-pro-BMP. 
You've got a normal ejection fraction. We mentioned that as being one of the hallmark differentiations from heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And then we've spoken about the importance of thinking about other causes for patient symptoms and using that to inform the way that we're going to interpret the MP results and indeed thinking about other comorbidities that might be impacting on symptoms. So that's the sort of thing that we're looking for. We're looking for this syndrome of signs and symptoms of heart failure with either structural evidence of um, the disease along with raised NT pro BMP levels. But some cautions, it can be a difficult diagnosis to make. And the gold standard, indeed, for diagnosing HFPES is an invasive right heart catheterization, something that very few patients are going to end up getting. But it can be challenging making this diagnosis on an echocardiogram. For example, patients in atrial fibrillation, it can be very difficult to make an accurate assessment of those diastolic measures of dysfunction. So that can be challenging. Or patients who have extremes of body weight, it might be difficult to get an accurate view of the heart on echocardiogram to interpret that. Also, we know that some of these changes can be quite common just with increasing age. So it's very common to have what's called grade one diastolic dysfunction picked up on an echocardiogram in people in their 70s and 80s. But that alone shouldn't be enough to make a diagnosis of HFPEF. So it can be a real challenge. If you're in a situation, I know there are some parts of the country where the sort of diagnostic pathway is that you directly organize an echocardiogram in a patient with a raised MP test, you might be getting back an echocardiogram. And I think that in that situation, I would just sort of caution you with thinking a bit more about these different pitfalls, but also there are scores that you can use to try and come to a diagnosis or um, to sort of triage the likelihood of a patient having HFPEF. So if you look on the ESC website, for example, there's a score there to help diagnose HFPEF, bringing in some of these echocardia parameters that can be there. For many of us, hopefully this will be a diagnosis that's confirmed or not in secondary care. And we've mentioned a bit of the underlying sort of epidemiology data. One of the reasons we're so keen to talk about this is because previously a lot of the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction was due to underlying ischemic heart disease. But as the treatment for those acute events gets better and we've got an aging population with more people who are overweight, more people living longer with hypertension, other long term heart conditions, we're seeing an increase in the proportion of patients who have HFPEF. So this is at the moment accounts for more than 50 percent of our heart failure population. But it's increasing and it's expected to go up to the next uh, up to about 70 percent of people with heart failure over the next 20 years or so. And a lot of these patients end up back in primary care because there isn't a huge role for secondary care in terms of device therapies or IV iron, for example, which can be used in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. There are relatively few medical therapies for these patients, so they do often end up back with us in primary care. So really important for us to think about the management. Also, because the outcomes are not dissimilar across the heart failure spectrum. So although this is sometimes seen as a milder form of heart failure, there's still significant implications in terms of the outcomes for our patients, both in terms of quality and quantity of life. So how can we treat patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction in primary care? Well, one of the real challenges again for us was that unfortunately, historically, a lot of those evidence-based treatments that seem to help people with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction don't work for the HEFPEF community. There is not the same evidence to say that beta blockers or ACE inhibitors, for example, offer prognostic benefit for patients with HEFPEF unless there's some other indication to use that medication. Interestingly, the MRA drugs like spironolactone, there's some debate about this medication. So one of the big studies that looked at this was called the TopCat study. This was an international study that recruited patients both in Americas and in Eastern Europe, in Russia and Georgia. And what they found is that across the whole study population, it was a negative outcome study. They didn't show a reduction in admissions to, heart failure, uh, to hospital with heart failure or cardiovascular death. But when they looked in patients in the Americas alone, they found that actually that cohort of patients did meet the primary outcome. And so the North American guidelines now suggest that there is some evidence, albeit not sort of a particularly high level of evidence, to suggest that you may want to think about spironolactone in patients with HFPEF, particularly patients, say, if they have a ejection fraction close to the bottom end of that sort of HFPEF range, or if they are patients where you might want to use it for, say, resistant hypertension or patients with a lot of fluid overload despite trying a uh, loop diuretic. So some evidence for spironolactone, but fairly weak recommendation. 
We've got some emerging evidence that I think is really interesting. So there's this study published in the New England Journal of Medicine just very recently looking at semaglutide, showing that this can induce weight loss in patients with HEFPEF, and that can lead to improvements in quality of life scores and in terms of exercise tolerance in overweight patients who have HEFPEF. So that's an emerging area of potential therapy and really interesting and reflects some of these therapies Uh, Some of the interventions that have tried to look at weight loss or very low calorie diets to try and um, improve patients' exercise tolerance with HEFPEF. And there's some data that if you can support overweight or obese patients with HEFPEF to lose weight, that that also leads to improvements in quality of life and improvements in exercise capacity. And that's something where we might be really well placed in primary care to broach that discussion with our patients and think about referring on patients to um, either weight management resources in the community or indeed tier three weight management services where available. Really important also to go back to that point of thinking about treating comorbidities because they will very commonly be there in HEFPEF and that might be very important in terms of outlook for patients and in terms of their quality of life. But the big new results um, in heart failure, this is just summarizing that, the big new results in heart failure is this central role that you can see here, the yellow box, is the role of the SGLT2 inhibitors for patients with HEFPEF. And this is becoming a real sort of core treatment for the cohort of patients. And this is based on these two landmark studies published over the last year or two, Emperor Preserved and Deliver, both in fact strikingly similar studies large randomized control studies of around 6,000 patients who recruited people with HEFPEF, with or without diabetes, to either empagliflozin or dapagliflozin. And they followed them up to look for the composite primary outcome of death from a cardiovascular cause or hospitalization with heart failure. And there were very consistent results really across these two studies. So when they were pooled in this Lancet meta-analysis, they found about a 20% reduction over the follow-up time, which was about two and a half years of these studies for that composite primary outcome, particularly strong in terms of the benefits for heart failure hospitalization. And what this is leading to is this sort of change here that SGLT2 inhibitors, certainly the conclusion from the paper, is that these are being seen as a real foundational component of heart failure management, indeed, irrespective of people's left ventricular ejection fraction. So that's whether it's HEF-REF, HEF-PEF, or that group in the middle, heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. And this is now reflected in the NICE guidelines. So there was a technology appraisal from NICE last year, which has approved the use of SGLT2 inhibitors for patients with HEF-PEF, as well as with HEF-REF as well. We just wanted to touch a little bit on the long-term follow-up of these patients, because particularly patients with HEFPEF, many of these will come back to us in primary care. And you can see at the bottom here some of the quaff points reflecting what Um, we may want to think about in terms of good management and follow-up for patients with heart failure. So an annual review of patients on our heart failure registry is really, really important. Thinking about, are they on the different evidence-based medication to help with with heart failure? There may be many patients who out there have got a diagnosis of HEF-PEF or heart failure that hasn't been coded as either HEF-PEF or HEF-REF who are not on these medications. So that might be a really nice quality improvement project to invite patients back for a review and think about whether they are now eligible for an SGLT2 inhibitor. That annual review is a really important time to look at those comorbidities. Are we managing their renal failure, their lipids, their atrial fibrillation, their hypertension, their weight management? Are we doing all we can in terms of that cardiovascular risk assessment to try and optimize those those things as much as we can? I think another really important point is to recognize that the um, disease course for heart failure doesn't tend to be linear. It tends to be a fluctuation periods where patients might be quite stable, where they might be quite settled on their disease, on their medication, but then periods of decompensation, possibly triggered by another acute event such as infection. So alerting patients to that possibility can be really helpful so that they know if they start developing fluid buildup, that's a time when they should get back in touch with you in primary care to review the the diuretic dose, review their medication overall, and to try and do that at an early stage to avoid them ending up in hospital needing intravenous doses or higher doses of diuretic medication. So going back to Alison, so she was put on fruzamide. She was also switched to dapagliflozin because that's a drug that's going to help both her diabetes, her CKD, and indeed her heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. 
I think she was actually on dap- in dapamide, but we mentioned she had difficult to treat hypertension. She also had a fairly low potassium level. So she might be someone to think about spironolactone for as a drug, obviously with close monitoring of that, particularly in the early stages to make sure that that's okay with her. And you could refer Alison on for weight management courses and exercise classes as some really helpful things that might be practical to do in primary care to help with Alison. So it's a much more optimistic outlook, I think, for HEFPEF in terms of the range of things that we can offer now in primary care. Really, really important that we're feeling confident about that. So quick conclusions. We've spoken about heart failure with preserved ejection for accounting for increasing proportion of the heart failure population. Similar symptoms to HEFREF, but challenges in terms of some of those medications that are used in that population, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction for this HEFPEF community. But now we've got emerging evidence, particularly with the SGLT2 inhibitors as a key component of the manager and the one drug that I think we should be thinking about for all our patients with heart failure if we can. I'm going to stop there. I think we're probably going to run over by a few minutes. Obviously, if you have to drop out, please do. And you can follow up on the last Q&A. But it would be great just to have another 10 minutes for anyone who can stay with us to go through. I'm sure there's, I can see there's hundreds more questions coming in uh, based on the second half of the chat. So do stay with us if you can. I'll go over to Kate to summarize the questions that are coming in. And then we'll hear from Ahmed about what he thinks about some of those core topics. So over to you, Kate. Thank you very much, Nick. What a fantastic presentation. What a useful presentation for us in, for us in primary care. Uh, and so many questions have, um, have been flagged for this. Um, going forward, Nick, for your cardiology course, we definitely need to talk about the, what, what ECHO reports actually are trying to tell us, because loads of questions about ECHO reports, lots of questions regarding you know, how we manage this this challenge that we've got in primary care where you, know, you think your patient has clinically got heart failure, you do the BNP, the BNP is raised. Then the next stage is that you want to get them seen in heart failure clinic and started on some medication, but you know that the wait time for that is several months down the line. What do you do with these patients in the meantime? And I think that that is a perennial challenge for so many of us just looking at the comments coming through. So, um, So some questions really to reflect back then. So um, what would your advice be, Ahmed, if you have that patient that classically you think has got heart failure, um, you know that the referral time is going to be several months down the line, as it is in so many areas um, where people are working who are on this this evening. Um, What should we be doing for these patients? How should we pragmatically manage these patients whilst they're waiting to be seen? What would be your thoughts on that? Well, it, it, that's a very difficult one. Um, and I think what you need to do is you need to treat symptoms. So if you have a long wait to echocardiography, what you need to realize is just because they've got raised NT pro BMP doesn't mean they have heart failure. And it vary, anything from 30% up to 70% may not have any heart failure on echocardiography from various studies. So if they have an indication for an ACE inhibitor, so CKD, diabetes, um, diabetes, hypertension, then good idea to get them on it at the optimal dose that you need to control um, those conditions. If they've got um, fluid retention, by all means, use a diuretic. I saw a few questions there. I would always just start with 40 milligrams because the response is so variable. You can then up it to 80, reduce it to 20, something I call dynamic diuretic dosing. I would, may start a beta blocker if they have AF and, heart fa- and possible heart failure, but really, We shouldn't be starting medications if we don't have a firm diagnosis of heart failure if there's no other indication. Lovely. Thank you. And I guess just following on from that, um, because, of course, SGLT2 inhibitors are the the new kids on the block. And there is this building um, bank of evidence that, that patients would benefit from being on them. In many areas, SGLT2 inhibitors are still amber drugs or need to be initiated by secondary care. So 
what practical advice would you have for people who are working within those constraints? Uh, first of all, I'm very surprised at that. I was at an NHS England meeting that said that 95 of the percent of the country is now green. And it, and, and it exasperates me. I think NICE made a mistake in saying that SGLT2s should only be started by primary care on the advice of, of a specialist team, um, despite the fact that we've been using SGLT2s in primary care for what? Almost 10 years in diabetes. They're easy to start, very well tolerated in the majority of patients. You don't need any monitoring. You don't need any titration. The evidence is there. Just get on and use them. I wish we could. And I find that very, very frustrating. So I think what we need to say that in someone with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, ideally, all symptomatic patients should be on the four pillars of care. Because we know that the four pillars, compared to our conventional ACE ARB beta blocker, do far better in terms of mortality, morbidity, hospitalizations, quality of life. So they should be on an ACE or an ARB. In the UK, you should only start in Tresto by a specialist team if they have an ejection fraction of less than 35%, but many consultants are still using it in patients above that. A licensed beta blocker, spironolactone or a pleuron, and an SGLT2. And in my opinion, there's no significant difference between dapagliflozin or empagliflozin 10. Very similar studies, and they're beneficial. And I think every patient with mild to reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction should also be on an SGLT2 inhibitor, especially if they have diabetes, but also non-diabetics, because the evidence base is so strong. And that's exactly what the American guidelines say. Sadly, NICE is always out of date. We don't um, sort out the guidelines rapidly. ESC changes them, um, update them every couple of years. Our NICE heart failure guidelines were 2010, then 2018, for God's sake. And now it's 2024. Um, and the NICE guidelines still just say the dual therapy, not the four. Thank you. And I, I guess we have perhaps one final question, because this has come up um, several times throughout, sure. the, throughout our Q&A, is um, because there is this sort of arbitrary difference between HEF-REF and HEF-PEF. So is it, with, with the natural history of heart failure in your experience, do, if, if <laughs> patients start off with a diagnosis of HEF-PEF, do they, over time, are they likely to, to sort of have worsening ventricular function, drop in their ejection fraction, and then sort of move into the HEF-REF um, zone, and therefore their sort of management needs to be re-optimized at that point? Is that what normal is, is that the natural progression for heart failure? No, it's not. It's incredibly variable. Um, I, 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 would, I, I don't know what you meant by arbitrary, Kate. Because it's not really arbitrary, is it? You've got clear guidance as to which is which. I think we make the diagnosis of HEF-PEF too complicated, and so do many secondary care consultants. And I think Nick summarized it beautifully. Someone who's got symptoms and or signs, someone who's got raised NT BMP, someone who has an echo that shows an ejection fraction over 50%, and then either left ventricular hypertrophy or left atrial enlargement and or evidence of diastolic impairment using, I, we tend to use mitral valve inflow velocity, not the tricuspid regurgitation velocity that um, Nick mentioned. If they have that, they've got HEFPEF. Now, not every HEFPEF patient goes on to get HEFREF. In fact, the majority don't. Um, but as I answered one of the questions, if someone has got worsening symptoms 
then I would refer back for an echocardiogram. Um, or if you have open access that is dependent on raised NT pro BMP, do the NT pro BMP and get the echo done again. And that may show either worsening diastolic filling, which means worsening HEFPEF, or they could have developed mildly reduced or reduced ejection fraction, which then means they become eligible for the outcome benefits of the RASI drugs, so ACRB, um, ARNIs, beta blockers, and MRAs, for which there is no good evidence for HEFPEF. So I think it should be judged all per, per person, a tailored approach, and patients should be reassessed if they're worsening, despite being on either high-dose diuretics or an SGLT2. Thank you. That was beautifully put. And look, we could keep going, I think, for an awful lot longer, but I'm mindful of time. So perhaps, Nick, I'll hand back to you now to wrap it all up, and I'll just answer a few more questions before we finish. Thanks, Ahmet. Thank you very much, Kate, and I've, I've really enjoyed it. And yes, um, there were lots of questions there I would have liked to, to answer. Perhaps we'll redo it again. That would be great. Thank you. Thank nice. Thanks you. so much for joining us, Ahmed. It is fantastic to have you here to answer all these tricky questions um, and to put it so lovely and, you know, simply, if I may say, to make it, make the difficult things clear for us. I think that's really helpful. We have been overwhelmed by how many of you have been online today. Thank you so much for giving up your time on the evening. It's been great to see all the engagement. And as we have said, I wish we had longer, but we will think about putting on another webinar before too long. And as I mentioned, we are doing the new MB cardiology course where there will be more time to dig into some of these topics. So do please join us if you can. Your feedback is really important to us. It's how we uh, decide what topics we're going to cover next and about how we might adjust the courses. So if you could bear to spare two minutes after the end of this course, please complete the online survey and uh, it will come up in your browser once the session ends. We would really, really appreciate that. Otherwise, just to say thank you again for joining. We hope you've enjoyed the session. You can watch it again online if you'd like to, if there's anything you missed. Do email us if there's any outstanding questions that we didn't get round to and you'd like to ask. Hope to see you all again on an MB Medical webinar soon. Have a great evening. Goodbye. <laughs>